This is another iRaw podcast. And so it was just, it's just been assumed for like, you know, 3,000 years that animals, that the question of politics has no relevance for animals because, you know, or put another way, that politics is in fact understood as the, the, the domain in which we separate ourselves from the animals. So everyone acknowledges that there's some ways in which humans and animals are similar, but what distinguishes us what, what enables us to rise above animality is that we alone have the ability to make collective choices about how to live. And so the, it, the, the, the very idea of politics, it, it, as in the Western tradition, is kind of inherently exclusionary of animals. It's, it's, and and in, in, in a way that's proven to be more of a barrier than the idea of moral status. Everyone, welcome back to the Animal Tone Podcast. It's season six. Yay! I bet you thought I wasn't going to get another season out this year, but you were wrong. It's season six, and this season we're focusing on animals and politics. Now, this season's quite intimately related to season one, where we looked at animals and the law, but I think retake and a look at animals and politics is really important. And in kind of a nice, beautiful synergy, my first guest for this season is Will Kimilka once again. I'm absolutely delighted to have him back on the show. As always, Will is, you know, he's an incredible thinker and his ideas with regards to animals and politics and the ways in which they can be included in society, as well as how their society should be thought about, are fascinating and, you know, challenging academically and personally. And I'm really, really excited that I managed to get him back on the show. So I hope you enjoy. But a little bit about him, if you don't know who Will Kimlicka is, he is the Canada Research Chair in Political Philosophy in the Philosophy Department at Queen's University in Kingston, Canada, where he has taught since 1998. He is the co-author with Sue Donaldson of Zoopolis, A Political Theory of Animal Rights, which has been mentioned many, 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 many times on this show. It's now been translated into German, French, Spanish, Japanese, Turkish, Dutch, Chinese, Korean, and Polish. So it's out there for you. Zoopolis argues that animals belong at the heart of the democratic political theory, defending rights of citizenship for domesticated animals and sovereignty rights for wild animals. And its ideas have helped to launch the recent quote-unquote political turn in animal ethics. Will and Sue have continued developing their model of Zoopolis and its implications for animal advocacy, legal reform, and alliances with other social justice movements. We speak about some of those developments today. We spend considerable time talking about some of the ideas that Will and Sue have developed, and I hope you enjoy. Hi, Will. Welcome back to the Animal Turn Podcast. Oh, thanks. It's great to be back. You were my very, very first interviewee on the show, and <laughs> it's it's there's actually a really nice kind of circle to all of this because it was near at the beginning of my time at Queen's and learning about animal studies, and we were sitting in your office. Yeah, it was gosh, this was just like pre these were pre COVID times, right? So long ago, and now um, the PhD is done and the podcast continues. So I'm really. Really, really happy to have you back on the show. It feels like a, a moment of progress for the podcast. Uh, congratulations on all the great success you've had so far with the with the podcast. Well, thank you. A lot of the credit also goes to you and Sue for all the support you've given throughout throughout the podcast. The mentorship from from both of you has been phenomenal, and I and I cannot thank you enough. But before we get all mushy and gushy, because that's my tendency, I'm going to get all squishy. I'm hoping that today we can focus on politics as a as a concept because this whole season is going to be looking at animals and politics. And as we start the season, I, I tend to like to just unpack the broad idea. So what is politics and why should animal studies scholars be interested in politics? And kind of in a nutshell, I'm hoping that that is what we can get done in, in our conversation today. And I know we've had you on the show before, but for folks that maybe haven't listened to that episode, maybe you could tell us a little bit about you and how you came to be interested in kind of animals and asking these political sorts of questions. Right. So I'm a political philosopher in the philosophy department at Queen's University. And so my work has always been in the field of political theory, which focuses on issues of justice, rights, 
democracy, legitimacy, sovereignty. These are the core concepts that are used in my field to discuss basically how societies are governed. And what struck me is that animals are virtually completely invisible in political theory. That's changing slowly recently, but certainly when I was being trained as a political philosopher, I never once had a reading or a lecture or a course in which anyone raised the question, where do animals fit in our theories of democracy, sovereignty, the state? And what struck me in particular was how different that is from the field of moral philosophy. So political philosophy and moral philosophy are two different subfields. And within moral philosophy, the animal question has been, has been quite high profile, at least since the 1970s. So if it, almost anyone who took an introductory course in, in moral philosophy or ethics, applied ethics, would probably be introduced to the animal question. It's, it's one of the core, it's now one of the core questions in moral philosophy. But the question they ask is, what is the moral status of animals? Do, do animals have moral status? If so, is it the same as humans? Whereas, so the animal question has, has a foothold in moral philosophy. It's still relatively invisible in political philosophy. And Sue and I actually confirmed this by looking up political philosophy textbooks. And it, it is still amazing that, that the vast, vast majority of textbooks in, in political philosophy make no reference to animals. And so that got us thinking, why is it that animals have, as it were, made an entrance into moral philosophy and into debates about moral status? There obviously was, in retrospect, not that much resistance to including the animal question in, in moral philosophy and ethics. But political philosophy has remained highly resistant. And I, I think that's, I mean, there's all sorts of potential reasons. We're still actually trying to, it's still to my mind a bit of a puzzle why, why this considerable asymmetry between moral philosophy and political philosophy. But I think part of it is that the idea of politics, the very idea of politics, at least as we've inherited it in the Western tradition, it's, it's very, if you like, human exceptionalist. It's, it assumes that only humans can engage in politics, that politics is something that involves making collective decisions about the kind of future one wants to lead. And it's just assumed that animals can't have politics, can't do politics, because they are essentially biologically determined. They're just they don't have choices. They don't have alternative futures. There's just, they just enact some biologically determined script that as a result of evolution. So, so they, they, there are no choices for them to make. There are no alternative futures. There, there's just instincts and drives that are biologically determined. Whereas humans are unique in having the capacity to actually make collective judgments, collective decisions about alternative ways of living, of living together. So we as individuals make individual decisions about what kind of lives we want to lead, but, but politics is when we need to make collective decisions about how we want to live. And so it was just, it's just been assumed for like, you know, 3,000 years that animals, that the question of politics has no relevance for animals because, you know, or put another way, that Politics is, in fact, understood as the, the, the domain in which we separate ourselves from the animals. So everyone acknowledges that there's some ways in which humans and animals are similar, but what distinguishes us, what, what enables us to rise above animality, is that we alone have the ability to make collective choices about how to live. And so the, it, the, the, the very idea of politics, it, as in the Western tradition, is kind of inherently exclusionary of animals. It's, it's, and and in, in, in a way that's proven to be more of a barrier than the idea of moral status. People are, are able to think about how animals are included in the, moral, in the moral circle. You know, Peter Singer famously said, the task of the animal advocacy movement 
is to expand the moral circle. And I think the, the advocacy movement has had some success in including animals in the moral circle, but had virtually no success in including animals in the political circle, in this the, the circle of beings who are conceived of as having a stake in and a, and a right to participate in politics. Why the separation between morals and politics? Is that a, is that a common way of thinking about politics? Is politics normally construed as being separate from moral questions? Or is this just a, a, a divide in philosophy where you've got this kind of sub separation of moral philosophy and political philosophy? Or is, you know, political science, for example, does that also not contend with these types of moral questions? Or is this just kind of, am I just smashing together different disciplines here that think about politics in variable ways? So I think the, the distinction between morality and politics is, it, 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 may, it, it may be particularly strong in philosophy, but I, I don't think it's unique to philosophy and I don't think it's... it's so moral philosophy is really focused on how an individual agent should reason through their moral choices. And so it's an attempt to kind of map what are the moral, moral philosophy, at least in, in the contemporary tradition, is just you start with a, an agent, a moral agent, who, who tries to map the moral reasons that are, that are germane to a particular decision. But what distinguishes politics is that someone, it, 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 there's a requirement that we make a decision collectively and that that collective decision be enforceable. And so politics involves the idea of authority, at least in the, in the Western tradition. And, and the goal is to create, I mean, political philosophy is often described as having as its goal how to think about the creation of legitimate authority. How is it legitimate that there's somebody, something like the parliament that can, that has the authority to, to govern me, to, to, to order me to do things. And so there, the, the fundamental question of political philosophy is not what are the, how to map moral reasons that an individual moral agent faces. It's how to construct relationships of authority, relationships of governance such that we can point to some body, some person or collective body who, who has yeah, the legitimate power, the legitimate right to make decisions that are binding on others. And as soon as you ask that question, then what you're asking about, you're raising questions about jurisdiction, like over what decisions does this body have the right to make choices? You're raising questions about sovereignty over what territory does this body have a right to govern? But also, uh, in a way, fundamentally, of representation. This, this authority is likely, it, it, at least in the Western tradition, this authority is only legitimate if it truly represents those it's governing. So, the, so one of the, one of the you know, classical questions in political philosophy is how do we think about the relationship between those who govern and those who are governed? And how do we make sure that the, those who govern track the interests of the governed. And that, so that raises issues of representation, accountability in, in the modern era, democracy, elections, and so on. And, and about justification, how does, how does this governing body justify itself to those it governs? Uh, and so then you get ideas about deliberation and oversight. And yeah, and so we've built this kind of complex set of concepts that are fundamentally about the relationship of uh, they're about how to theorize relationships of authority and how to determine when relationships of authority are legitimate, as distinct from this question about just thinking of ourselves as an individual moral agent and trying to map a moral reason. I see. So it operates at two separate levels as well. So there's a definite collective. I think legitimate authority helps me think about this in several ways. One, when we think about politics now, I'm, I'm inclined then to say, well, if we're thinking about legitimate authority and animals, there's one way in which we could look at animal societies and collectivities and think about how they have structured legitimate governance structures themselves. And this this kind of dismantles that idea that politics is in and of itself a, a human-centric idea. And then the second way is, well, how do we include or animals in human political structures? So how are animals part of our existing collectivities? 
Now, which of those, like, do you look at both of these two types of structures or which of these are you, are you interested? Or at least would you agree with that kind of synopsis of you could think about legitimate authority in these two ways? So Sue and I actually just finished a paper in which we talk about three models. So one is how do we include animals in human decision-making? So we, we start from, from things like existing national political systems and ask, how do we ensure that the interests of animals are adequately represented? And this is typically, the, what, the way this model works is to imagine that we might appoint some humans to speak on behalf of animals. So these could be animal advocates, animal representatives, so there are modest and ambitious versions of this. The modest version is just that you might have someone who would be asked or authorized to speak on behalf of animals at a, at a parliamentary committee, say, but who, who wouldn't necessarily have a right to vote. They're, they're just a kind of advice. They have, they have an advisory function. The ambitious version is you might actually imagine setting aside parliamentary seats for animals. And some people have proposed it, like 10 seats in the House of Parliament would be set aside for people who are whose task it is to, to advocate for and represent the interests of animals. So we call that politics on behalf of animals. So, and that's one way to include animals, is we can think about who appointing, appointing or electing some humans to act on behalf of animals within human politics. The second model, as you said, is to instead think about the ways in which animals govern themselves, that they, they too face this task of making collective decisions. They too have to construct legitimate authority precisely because animals aren't just biologically determined. They, they, they confront a whole slew of complicated decisions they need to make and often need to make collectively. And, it, and so just like humans, they face a challenge about how, how to ensure that, that, that authority, uh, that there is some authority in the community to make these decisions and that that authority is perceived as legitimate by others. And so there's, this is actually a, a huge area of ethological research, which I think is just fascinating. To, that is all the different kinds of procedures that animal communities use to basically construct legitimate authority. And in some cases, it's about seniority you know, so that the elder members of the community have a, have a more of a vote on certain decisions. In, in other cases, it's a bit more majoritarian. In some cases, it depends on what issues at stake. That certain members of the community are seen as having authority on some issues, perhaps because they have specialized knowledge about it, but on other issues, they may not be the authorities. So it's not like there's a single authority structure for all issues. But anyway, so, so we can start thinking, so from our view, this is we call this politics by animals. So we have politics on behalf of animals, which humans speak on behalf of animals. And here we have politics by animals in which they are governing themselves and they are, they are making choices, they're making decisions according to authority structures. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that they do that and that they have a right to do that and that what we should be trying to do in our relations with wild animals is not only or necessarily to be thinking about how we relate to them one by one and respect their individual rights, but also respect, I feel like, their collective right to, to govern themselves. They, they have a right to politics. They have a right to engage in their own politics. And that means we should, we should uh, not do anything that would undermine their authority relations. And there's some really interesting work that's done on how humans do intentionally or unintentionally undermine these authority relations within wild animal communities. So there's these you know famous studies about with elephant troops that what that if the elder like matriarchs are are hunted, then sometimes the younger elephants go rogue because they're not subject to a legitimate authority within the community and and then they become dangerous to other members of the community as well as to other animals or humans nearby and and so it's really important for the well-being of that community and its uh, relations with others that these authority structures be maintained. Isn't another example with wolves, and I think this is quite topical right now, when, when folks hunt wolves, they tend to, the whole packs can kind of uh, disentangle. Yeah. So that's the second model. So we have politics on behalf of animals. We have politics by animals. And then the third model which is harder, you know, which, which 
which I think we need to think more about, is what we call politics with animals. So are there times and places... So in the first model, it's basically humans are doing all the politics. Some of them are, are asked to speak on behalf of animals, but it's, politics is understood as humans deliberating with humans about what to do, even if some of those humans are asked to speak on behalf of animals. The second one is politics is by animals amongst with other animals. But is it possible to imagine that we're doing, that we have politics with animals? This is something we do together, something that we jointly do. So we sometimes call it joint politics. And so that's our, our one example that we've looked at for that is farmed animal sanctuaries. So in that case, we think we can think about farmed animal sanctuaries as micro sites in which these uh, formerly farmed animals who've been rescued for, from industrial agriculture and the humans need, they need to make a bunch of decisions. And at least in some sanctuaries, they are really committed to trying to make these decisions together. And so they're trying to think about it's not just that they'd have someone speaking on behalf of animals, and it's not just that they'd let animals make their own decisions, although both of those also happen, but that there would be trying to think about a, a process by which, you know, the animals could propose something to the humans, and the humans could propose something to the animals, and that what would emerge is, is the outcome of an iterative process of bargaining, negotiation, trial, and experiment. And so we think that at least at, 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 at some farmed animal sanctuaries, we, we could really, you know, th these are not, for all sorts of reasons, they're, they're, they're not, as it were, ideal. These are not the ideal conditions to be experimenting in, in joint politics, partly because the animals often are highly traumatized, you know, from their experience in industrialized agriculture and their limits on resources and so on. But still, I, we think that, that many of the decisions that are made about routines, about the way in which physical space is organized, about what kinds of activities are undertaken, about what kinds of relationships within and across species. All of these really can be described as jointly authored, the result of joint politics. And so that's one example of joint politics. And then we're also thinking about some forms of urban design with, with urban wildlife, so what we call liminal animals, as possibly also falling under the setting of joint politics. And so, you know, there's a lot of interest amongst urban design people, urban planners. Cities, cities historically have been, uh, have been planned by and for humans to the almost complete neglect of, of the interests of animals. You, I know you've, you had a whole series on, on the city, but there's growing recognition that the, the, the liminal animals have a right to be there. It's, it's their city as well. So how can we moving forward, how can we plan public spaces and infrastructure and so on in a way that take, not just takes the interests into account, because that could be politics on behalf of animals, but is also jointly authored with those animals? How can we think of this as a, a process of a, a kind of iterative process in which we're looking for what they're trying to tell us? We make suggestions to them about, about yeah, so those, that's what we're working on these days. So... So to make this more tangible, following through with the, the kind of city example, and I imagine the same would be true with sanctuaries. So I know, for example, a lot of urban animals like to use, you know, there's often like riverbanks or I don't know the word of it now, like depressed riverbanks. <laughs> any, any ecologist who's listening to is probably cringing. But, you know, waterways that are often underdeveloped by human design is often used as kind of highway systems for many liminal animals that move through. There's, there's pathways and a lot of actually wildlife activity happens in areas that many humans might look at as, and think as being neglected or, you know, not used. And I can imagine that as we become more sensitive to animals in cities and animals having a claim to urban space, that these spaces and when, when development does come or developments do change, the area that they're done in a way that's sensitive to how perhaps foxes move through those areas or cranes come into those areas, that is this kind of part of that iterative process where before developments would happen there, maybe this would stop a development from happening there, or it would mean a development that happens in a way that's sensitive to how these animals have historically used that space. Yeah, so that's definitely part of it. And, and another part of it is, you know, with, with climate change, there's just going to be a lot of, you know, kind of retrofitting of urban 
space. And so forms of, you know, many, many urban animals, wild animals have, urban wildlife have, have managed to find uh, often under very, you know, un unjust conditions and so on, but, they, but, uh, but they found accommodations and so on. But we're going to have, as a result of climate change, probably new animals moving into the city and some of the ways in which existing animal animals have adapted may become unsustainable if, you know, the temperature rises and so on. And so even for those animals for whom the city has sort of worked as a home in the past, it, it, it may not be, the future may, may not be so bright unless we start thinking about how can we proactively create forms of mitigation and adaptation for them as well as for us. Yeah, I had Daniel Claude on the show not too long ago who spoke about koalas and how koalas are moving into Australian cities in numbers never seen before following the, the wildlife fires. And that chances are, you know, koalas and other animals are going to increasingly move into cities as resources become, you know, more and more fraught. So I, I really appreciate this kind of idea of politics on behalf of animals, politics by animals and politics with animals. You know, and I'm, I'm assuming here when you say by animals, it's not just happening at a species specific level here. When you're saying politics by animals, you're not saying, oh, it's, you know, it's just monkeys with monkeys. It's also how monkeys navigate a shared space with other species. So there's two different things there. One is politics by animals is done primarily at the level of not like there's not a single whale politics. There's not a single monkey politics. It occurs primarily at the level of flocks, herds, pods, troops. There may be, and there are, interesting variations between different herds, pods, flocks in how those authority structures are organized. And so, and that's related, uh, as you know, to all this growing evidence that 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 animals have cultures. That so the culture, the 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 kind of if you like political culture of one baboon troop may be different from the political culture of another baboon troop, and and so that's that's the unit of of animal politics is not not species, but but communities who develop so that they have these communal group norms about how decisions are made and so on. Yeah, but then a, a second question is. We, we need to think about how you know that, that both animals and humans are part of ecosystems and there needs to be kind of you know if you like the governing of ecosystems and so with respect to that one of the one of the ideas that sue and i have been working on is the idea of an interspecies commons and so that in, again, if you think about this from our perspective as political theorists, the, the way in which political theory thinks about land and space is in terms of sovereign territory. So the political theorists look out at the world and see 192 countries, each of whom has exclusive jurisdiction over its territory. So every piece of land belongs to one country and one country has exclusive claim over its territory. And so that, that way of thinking about territory obviously completely ignores animals, many of whom cross these international borders. And it, 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 so in, in some cases, it, it, I think it's, it's appropriate for humans, if in, you know, there are, there are still parts of the world where humans have a very little presence. And I, I think it, for, for some of those areas, it's, it's appropriate for us to say that that territory belongs to the wild animals who live there and not to us. And that, we, and that you know, we should not think of ourselves as having the right to colonize and develop the, the homelands of wild animals. But in other cases, and particularly with, with respect to liminal animals, we, we, are, we are sharing territory. And so we need to be able to think of territory. On the one hand, it is, there are ways in which existing, you know, national legislatures are governing territory as, as, as part of our right, because humans as well as other animals have rights of self-government. So we govern ourselves on, on, on territory and that 
But but this this territory over which we exercise self government is also the territory that belongs to other animals, and so we need to think of it as a commons. And then the question is, what are the? How do we think about the governing of a commons in a way that acknowledges the right to belong of all of the animals that, that um, live off of and depend on uh, the the commons? And so it, this is, I mean, it's it's really quite a complicated challenge. But we're trying to think through in terms of political theory the relationship between these inherited ideas of kind of national sovereignty over political territory with these ideas of an interspecies commons, because we think you actually need both. Mm, and, and I, you know, I have Steve, Steve Cook coming on where we speak a bit about habitat rights and I've, I've kind of done a little bit of an inverse. I've interviewed him before interviewing you. And I know he speaks about, you know, the need to, to recognize that animals use this space and that it's, it's important to their survival, to their cultures, to their well-being, and that their claim to land needs to be acknowledged. But what I find really interesting about this idea of politics by animals is when you were using collective nouns there, which made me realize that maybe we've almost always implicitly known that animals do govern themselves in these particular types of settings, right? Pods, troops, these are all... I don't know, we've almost always known that animals don't operate at a species level, but that they self-govern, you know, based on familial connections. There's, there is some, you know, animals that leave a, a specific group and will join another group, but that this also happens across species. And I think you can look at many herd animals across the, the African savannah, right, who will move with one another. Very rarely do wildebeest just move alone. They move with a whole host of other animals. And I think that when you start to think of a savannah as, a, you know, a multi-species political space where these animals are moving together, they're migrating together in a in what's a very organized way, actually. And when you start to think of that as a political movement, it changes the tenor and the significance of it in, in different ways. This is no longer only a question about conservation and protecting their land. It's also a matter of protecting their their social groups, their their claims to be the way they've always been or want to change and respond to things like climate change, as you mentioned. What I also think is quite fascinating about this conversation so far is it, it, it disrupts some of my kind of traditional ideas of politics. So for me, politics has always been, you know, who gets what, when, where, and how, that kind of classical, you know, resource allocation. And to some extent, that is what we're talking about, who who has claim to land, who has claim to healthcare, who has... But you're not just talking here about policy and governance in this, like, big overarching way you're speaking about how politics is practiced is is that is that fair so politics goes beyond just institutions and governments and policy and voting it's also about how social worlds and societies are practiced so th this is it's it's a very good question and one of the it, it it's actually goes in a way it goes to the heart of of political theory and political philosophy. So our, our, if you think about the, the way academia has developed, there is this divide between anthropology and sociology on the one hand, which studies society, and then political science, which studies politics and or the state or, and or the government. And so the partly because of this kind of professional disciplinary division a lot of a lot of discussion in politics has a kind of it's almost invested in exaggerating the difference between politics and society between political life and social life whereas my own view is that you know basically we are social animals humans and and other animals are, are social animals we have, we have a social life. Because we have a social life, there are certain things we need to do, we need to get done, certain decisions we need to make. And politics is, is, a, is a vehicle for, for a community to do things. And so it's, it's, we, can't, we can't really understand. Politics is not, it's not, it's, it's not an isolated domain out there somewhere. It's just emerges and I think in a way necessarily emerges given given the requirements of living together as social animals. 
And so from our point of view, you know, the, 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 the distinction between, so f- to give a concrete example, um, the, we could, one can spend quite a bit of time and effort trying to, to conceptually distinguish social norms from political norms, from legal norms, and, and, and there's huge debates about how exactly we distinguish these. But, you know, from, from my point of view, what they share is that there are norms about how we are going to live together. And there needs to be mechanisms for deciding what those norms are, but also for contesting them. It, in, any, in any group, there's going to be contestations over what the norms are about how we do things around here. And so I, I think of that, that what we need is essentially a kind of rich understanding of the social life of social animals. And then, and then, we'll, see, and then we'll see politics there. I, I, and I'm, in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm less obsessed than some of my colleagues about policing the, uh, you know, trying to figure out exactly what, what part of this social life of social animals we're going to put under the heading of politics. In a way, I'm less obsessed with that question. I I, I think that that that's, again that the the point is we're social animals. We have a social life. We therefore need social norms. We need process mechanisms for making decisions about social norms. And there's there's, there's and that and therefore we need authority relations. And then we need mechanisms for <laughs> for contesting and challenging authority relations. And all of this. To, to my mind, we're, we're just, we're, we're inevitably getting into politics. Yeah, and I mean, this goes back to that kind of example you mentioned earlier with, with elephants and that I brought up with, with wolves, is when you start to just pay attention to the ways in which they're social. And at least if you, at least if you put on a political imagination, and I think this, this is key to what you were saying earlier, you know, for a long time we were just saying animals behave according to instinct. So that made all of these really intricate decision-making mechanisms, contestations, it made them invisible in, in, in some ways, or, or we just simply didn't see them because that was just written off as instincts, right? Or, or it's purely just got to do with reproduction or, you know, continuing the species. But when you start to put on a political lens of sorts, you start to think about this maybe with a bit more nuance with saying, okay, well, what, what, how, how is conflict resolution happening here? Is what appears to be aggression initially Aggression, or is it actually conflict resolution? If you pay attention to it over a longer period of time, and I think with wolves, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, and you might know this better than me, but I know that that whole alpha wolf idea has been dismantled for a long time because we had this tendency of thinking about wolves as, you know, alpha male has to be the boss, and and this has gone into how we train and treat dogs, how we think about numerous other species. And since then, a lot of ethologists have come back and said, well, actually, wolf society is much more based on collaboration and cooperation than it is domination. So, yeah, there's there's this interesting kind of step, I think, with political imagination, because we use our politics and we often imprint it on the ways in which we understand animal politics. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great point. I mean, it's so all, all that stuff about dominance hierarchies, it was so, which, which you know, dominated science, although it turned out to be completely unscientific. And, and so, and as you say, part of that is we were projecting our ideas onto animals, but then, but then that was used to justify the claim that, that certain forms of dominance are innate in humans as well. And so I, that, you know, the sociobiologists, you're too young, but uh, well, when I was when I was a student, there was all the rage about sociobiology, which was trying to say that dominant hierarchies are are kind of evolutionary encoded in all of us. And uh, yeah, I mean, so fortunately, we're getting beyond some of those ideas. It's interesting how that slippage works. How sometimes we use animals as a way of justifying our own behavior, and then other times we imprint our behavior on them. And and I mean, sometimes it's maybe you know it's reasonable to do so, but oftentimes I think there is. There is reason to pause and question why a particular theory is being pushed so hard at a particular moment in time. But of course, we're in it, so how do we get out of it? But before before I get carried away, I wanted to bring up just something I know that you've been working on a little bit in terms of thinking through politics and the significance of animals in political structures. So you've spoken a long 
You've, you and Sue have both written about social membership for a long time, how animals should be considered members of our societies, particularly domesticated animals, because we brought them into the domus. So if we make them part of our societies, we should at the very least recognize that they 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 should share in some of the benefits of belonging to a society. But more recently, you've been interested in how animals have been included in kind of the development of policy and regulation related to family relations and labor relations. And I assume that this is more kind of politics on behalf of and politics with animals. But why do you think looking at how animals are considered in labor law or family law, why do you think this is important when thinking about animals and politics? Right. So the so one way to think about it is that in the case of, of domesticated animals, no, let me step back. With respect to all sentient animals, we, we think there are certain obligations we have to animals, human and, and non-human animals, simply because of that they're sentient. They they have a, they have an experience of their lives going better or worse, and that, that should set limits on, on how we treat them and generates a set of universal rights. And a, a lot of, uh, historically, a lot of the animal rights movement has been focused on getting recognition of what we owe animals simply in virtue of the fact that they, they are sentient and have an intrinsic moral status. But in the case of domesticated animals, in addition to those basic rights that flow from being a sentient being, we think that justice requires acknowledging their membership in our society. We brought them into our society through domestication. They have over generations, they've been bred in order to, to live and work amongst us. And that therefore we should think about the society as, as belonging to them as well as to us. So then the, it, the, that's an argument we've made many times. But then the question is, what's the, what is going to... So if we're thinking about these, this membership domain, so uh, this means that the animal advocacy movement has, has, you know, we need to be moving on two different tracks. We still need to keep fighting for recognition of sentience and for the universal rights that flow from sentience, but we also need to be fighting for membership, recognition of membership and the distinctive rights and responsibilities that flow from membership in the case of domesticated animals. And, and there, I just think in that. If we think about other movements who have been confronted with this challenge of how do you make claims to social membership? I mean, the idea of society is kind of abstract. And, and, and so it's useful to try to think about what are the concrete moments? What are the concrete contexts where membership is really visible? And I think that two of these are the family and work. So it's, there's just so much overwhelming evidence that many people view their companion animals as members of the family, as members, not just as sentient individuals, but as members of a, of a, of a family, which they view as a collective unit. And so, and, and they, they talk about we, and they, you know, we went for a walk and they're including the companion animal in the we, and then they, and, and, and they, and so I think it's really important that we, we think about families as multi-species families. And I think the legal, and, and we see legal trends in this direction. And one of the most interesting is about divorce. When, when, a, when a couple divorces, in the past, the companion, and they had a dog or cat, the, the companion animal was just seen as a piece of property. And so it was subject to the same rules as the division of a couch or a closet or something. Whereas if we instead see the companion animal as a member of the family, the way that children are a member of the family, then the rules are that custody should be based on the interests of the animal, not on ownership principles. So different norms apply to members. And I think there's growing recognition that for legal purposes, companion animals really should be seen as members. And as I said, that's I think that's already part of the way most people think. Many people think about the companion animals, but the law is recognizing it. That membership is the right way to think about companion animals in relation to the family. And then in work, the, the historically at least, the way in which many groups have staked claims to membership is by making some kind of contribution to a to collaborative, to, to uh, some form of social co cooperation. 
And of course, we have recruited animals into the workplace all, in all sorts of ways, many of them completely unjust and exploitative. But there are at least some examples of interspecies workplaces where the humans and the animals view themselves as members of a work team, let's say. So if you, if you, you know, read the descriptions about humans and tracker dogs or sniffer dogs at the airport, they really, but the, the, the humans think of the dog as a co-worker and they think of, they, they often train together, they work the same hours, they work, and, and they, as colleagues. And they, they and so I, I think, again, certain kinds of work, certain kinds of interspecies workplaces, you could also think about therapy dogs, are very visible. It's really, so I guess what, I, what I'm saying is that in these specific contexts, it's really hard not to acknowledge what we have here is a case of social membership. There's just no way to understand that relationship except through the idea that we really are part of a social relationship, that we're, we're members of a cooperative, social cooperative scheme. And so I do, see, I, I do see some legal recognition in these contexts that we don't just have obligation to animals because they're sentient and suffer, but because... They, they are members of a, of a social unit and that it's really important to us that they be members, it's important to them, and, and we should treat them accordingly. So you're not saying here that normatively they should be part of the workplace or they should be part of the family. You're saying that it seems to be that regulation and laws are starting to recognize that they are part of families and workplaces and that regulation and law is starting to recognize them as such. So there's, there's two different, so the, the, I think that because we have brought domesticated animals into our, into our homes as companion animals and into our workplaces as, as working animals, we owe them membership rights, which are above and beyond the universal rights owed to all sentient beings. The, I don't think we have the unilateral right to force them to, to stay. And so I think it's really important to simultaneously, at, at the same moment that we acknowledge legally their membership, we also need to be thinking about how can, giving them the possibility of exiting. So I, 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 the, the initial domestication of, of animals was, was coercive and unjust. And, and so we need to contemplate the possibility that some domesticated animals will actually, given the choice, would like to exit from human society. And that could be exiting from a particular family or exiting from a particular workplace, or more generally, even exiting from humans, like kind of rewilding more generally. So I, we're, we're soon are very committed to the idea that we have these kind of exit options or off ramps. So we've brought domesticated animals into our society. It's up to them, on our view, it's up to be up to them whether they want to stay with us and, and if so, under what, where and under what terms and so on, acknowledging the possibility of that they may, they may exit. But my hunch is that in many cases, even if we provided effective options for animals, domesticated animals to exit, that if, if, if we, we, we treat animals truly as members of a shared society and respect their rights, that there are ways in which their lives can go better from interacting with us, just as our lives are enriched by interacting with them. I, I think there is something in the idea of interspecies sociability. The way in which humans and domesticated animals have developed the capacity for interspecies sociability immensely enriches the possible lives we can have. And I think it enriches the possibilities for the animals as well as for us if we stop exploiting them, harming them, killing them, and so on. And so my hunch is, I mean, Sue and I have argued this, that, that we, we would likely see quite a wide range of reactions if we institutionalize these exit options. So we, we, we're obligated to acknowledge the membership. We're also obligated to give them the option of exiting. So our hunch, we, we've said, is that we think many horses, for example, might exit. It's not clear to me 
that horses really get a whole lot out of their interaction with humans, maybe they just prefer to live amongst other horses in, in a kind of rewilded. But I think with, with many other domesticated animals, not just dogs, but also animals that are, that are currently in the industrial agriculture, I, with pigs and sheep and, and, and chickens and so on, it, it looks like they often enjoy human company and they may enjoy kind forms of relationships and activities and cooperation that they can do with humans. We need we need to find out what those are, but but it's not, I I I think we would see, and it's important to find out. We, of all these animals that we've domesticated, who of them want, which of them want to spend time with us? And, and again, that might not be at a, a species level. There might be some. There might be some who who don't want to leave. That are maybe more antisocial. Some that are more social. But I think I just want to make like clear that what you're not saying, because I can see how some folks might hear this saying, okay, we want, you know, animals to continue working and we want animals to continue being in our families as a kind of endorsement of breeding practices, which I know, which I know is not something that you also would ever kind of put on the table. It's not to perpetuate this kind of, you know, breeding of animals so that they can continue to be sniffing dogs or breeding. It's more a matter of thinking deeply about how, they want to socialize and work and get satisfaction from being in our families and work. Because what, what you also don't know is, again, it's kind of weird because I'm interviewing you after having done some of the, the later interviews in the season, is pet, pets come up quite a bit in the, the upcoming episodes as being kind of our, our pet relationships as being quite, it's, it's been a difficult set of conversations to have, you know, with Dinesh Wadiwell, with Angie Pepper, kind of this idea that we we have pets in our homes. A lot of us have dogs in our homes, but the kind of ways in which they're included in our homes are quite coercive. You know, they have to wear muzzles or leashes. They don't have freedom of movement or autonomy. So even though I view Linus as being a member of my family and, and I have very little doubt that he loves me too, the ways in which I've included him in my family are, need to change. And I guess this is where the political question comes in is, is it fair is it politically right that he is included in my family and in in our society in this way? Yeah. So exactly. So this is why the the the, int- the focus on on family and work are meant to be entry points to establishing the real goal, which is social membership. So the, these are meant to be just. The, the the most likely sites for people to be able to see social membership, but once we but so so they're not just members of the family, they're not just members of a workplace, they are members of society, and that means they have claims on society, not just claims on on family members, not just claims on coworkers, they have claims on society regarding social institutions, p- public institutions, public spaces, so. How, how do we organize things so that they don't need to be muzzled and leashed because public space would be organized in such a way as that there'd be much greater mobility for, for companion animals and how to make sure that they're not, that the only option that they have is not to live with just a singular nuclear family, but maybe, you know, in, in many parts of the world, dogs are like they're village dogs. They sort of belong to everyone, but belong to no one. And that's, it's entirely possible that that's the, the kind of, so it's not that they want to exit human society. They very much live in, in the village and, and interact very much with humans, but not as, as members of nuclear families, but as neighbor, you know. So I, 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 I totally agree with the observation that the existing, the, the, the fact that people view companion animals as members of the family does not yet do anything to change the fact that the broader social and political structures of society are profoundly unjust. But, but so the the question is just from my point of view, that if we want to overcome that injustice, I, I still think we need this two track strategy on the one hand, acknowledging the universal rights that that flow from all that flow to all sentient beings and on the other hand, acknowledging the distinctive obligations that arise because of the way in which we've brought them into our society. And and I wonder if a third one of those, which you also raised earlier, is this kind of urban politics and spatial management. Because again, here in Vienna, you know, comparing Vienna to Kingston and the ways in which domesticated animals are 
and, and let maybe just speak explicitly about dogs, are catered for in the urban environment is so different. And this to me also says that politically, at least in terms of policy and regulation and policing of the urban environment, animals have been thought about in pretty distinctive ways. So Uh, For example, here in Vienna, Linus can get on a bus, he can get in a subway system, he can come into restaurants. There are so many dog, what they call dog zones here, off-leash dog areas. There's entire like forested areas where dogs can be off-leash. Whereas in Kingston, you know, most restaurants and buildings I couldn't go into with Linus, public transport didn't allow him. And I think that this is really a clear example of how the regulation, the, the municipal regulation of different places can afford the same species in different places, very different access to to resources, to the benefits of that society. So even though in both situations, Linus was my property, whether I like it or not, he still had, he has a substantially different life in these different settings because of how the municipal regulations see him, which I think is quite like another really interesting kind of Inroad it makes me think of Singapore as well in terms of how Singapore is building different infrastructure to to cater for how animals move through the city and the kind of provisions that it's creating for humans to not go into some areas so that animals have space to 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 do their thing. So it's yeah. Anyway, I wonder if that's a third kind of inroad with with labor, family, and also just urban regulation. Yeah. So, but the the question is, if we do, if we think about the dog park case. Or, or the regulations about public transportation. What, what is, I, I think, that one way to understand that is that, that once people see companion animals as members of the family, then it's just, to my mind, the, the, the kind of obvious next step is, well, because because we are family, you know, we want to travel together. We want the holiday together. We want to have leisure together. And so all of these, you know, bizarre, bizarre restrictions in Kingston and, and in other places, they, they are inhibiting, I mean, the, you know, we can talk about why the, why these restrictions emerge, but the, the consequence today is that they're putting severe limits on the ability of families understood as interspecies families to to to, to do to do family things, right? And so I think I think it's it's my reading of the you know changing rules about public transportation is in part that that's it's because there's been this change around the family that there's been political pressure to change the rules about transportation. It would be an interesting research project because I, I would certainly, I would certainly assume that folks in in Austria versus Canada, there isn't you know one society that views the other as pets being more or less part of the family. I would say, kind of coming back to what you mentioned in the beginning, that that moral versus political. I think, I think most people would speak of their animals as being part of the family in both contexts. And obviously, I'm just speaking here anecdotally, but. Then it becomes a kind of historical question of why why have why has it manifested so differently in these different spaces, um, which is really really interesting. Well, we're we're at literally every single episode. Before I keep you here forever and ever and ever, do you have a, a quote ready for us? Yeah. So this is a quote that really struck me when I first read it. It's from an article by Gwendolyn Blue and Melanie Rock from 2014 called Animal Publics. And it just, it, it gets to this point about the distinctiveness of politics. Anyway, I'll just read it. Developments in social theory over the past few decades have unsettled deeply entrenched assumptions about what constitutes the human by exposing the tenuous divisions that separate humans, non-human animals, and technologies, and in turn affording a more active role to non-human entities in the constitution of social worlds. The concept of the public, however, remains persistently, stubbornly, and somewhat curiously entrenched in anthropomorphic imaginaries. Within and outside of academe, it is commonplace to suppose that publics are purely human and that publics arise from the unique human capacity for symbolic communication. So I remember when I read that in 2014, 
that, that just struck me as completely accurate. So what they're saying is, when we talk about the social world, we have become accustomed to recognizing that, um, you know, the, the idea that the, the social world is interspecies is increasingly acknowledged, at least in academia and in wide swaths of social theory. But as soon as we put on, as soon as we start looking at the world through this, through what, what I'm calling political concepts, like the public, so as soon as you put on the lens of the public, all of a sudden, all you see is humans, right? You, so if you put if you put on the society lens, you you may be able to see animals. You know, you 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 walk down the city park, you can see it. There, there are animals in our society, but you put on the the lens of the public, and you just see humans. And I think that's true. I I so so they're talking about the concept of the public, but I I would say the same thing is true about. Democracy, representation, sovereignty, jurisdiction, all, all, all of the words we use to describe politics, as soon as we look at the world through those lens, all we see are humans. I think it's really interesting. I mean, I wonder how much of this comes back to, again, this like imagination, which came up in there as well, as, as myself included, and I think many people, when they think about politics, they think about voting, and it's maybe a very deficient idea of what politics is, as you've kind of shown throughout this episode today, is, you know, politics is a whole range of different practices that make up society. It's the ways in which we collectively decide or resist or negotiate how we want our societies or, or respect others' societies. I think these are all political moves. But so often when we think about politics, I think in our imagination, we imagine people sitting in the House of Commons shouting, order, order, and 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 somehow that's where politics begins and ends. But it's so much more diverse and tricky and int more interesting than, than that. And I think when you start to look at animals, it, it, it opens it up in just really fascinating ways. So we... we, we... You're right, but the way in which this has played out in political theory is complicated. So, so the, the you're right that for people's first you mentioned the word politics, people first think of voting, and that animals seem excluded from that. In political theory, there's been a reaction against this reductive idea of politics as being just about voting. But what people so in, in starting in the 1980s, so in the 60s and 70s, the dominant account uh, really just was people talked about electoral democracy and vote centric uh, conception of politics. Starting in the 1980s, people realized we needed a richer account of politics. But the way in which they enriched it was through the idea of deliberation. And so we went from this old idea of, of electoral democracy or, or aggregative democracy, aggregating votes to deliberative democracy. But deliberative democracy turned out to be just as human centric as as vote. I mean, if it, so, if the way in which you enrich your account of politics is is by going beyond voting to deliberation, then then many people's idea of deliberation is in a way even more human centric, right? It's so preoccupied with proposition, the giving a, in propositional form of reasons. And so, I actually think that the turn to a richer theory of democracy in political theory, from aggregative democracy to, to deliberative democracy, actually made things worse for animals. So luckily, the, the, people are now recognizing we need to do yet another way of enriching politics. It's not just from voting to deliberation, it's going beyond deliberation to thinking about a much wider range of ways in which people express aspirations in which they resist illegitimate authority, a much more embodied idea of political agency, much more relational and distributed and so on. So, I, so I'm, I'm optimistic about, about the things moving forward in terms of getting a richer account of politics, but it's interesting that that initial shift from merely voting to an enriched account of deliberation, deliberative democracy actually did not help animals much. Has this third move with politics now towards thinking about it as being embodied, et cetera, is this, is this born of kind of a feminist turn in political philosophy or? Yeah, so it's, it's, it has its roots in, in feminist theories of uh, relational autonomy and, and it also has been picked up very strongly in the disability movement. I mean, the reality is that that, the 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 picture, particularly in its early the early versions 
of deliberative democracy were really quite exclusionary in their picture of, I mean, it, you know, the, 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 the sort of joke was that, that this is, you know, largely white university educated theorists imagining politics as being a bunch of them getting together and, and, and deliberating. It was so disconnected from the way in which many people, I mean, for most people, politics is, there's an emotional element to it. There's, there's all, all sorts of elements of, of social connection and it's highly ritualized. And, and, and then there are these moments of just in, a, a, a frustration and resistance. And all, all of that was very hard to make sense of in these highly rarefied images of deliberation. That's really interesting. I've got one one more question for you before we we close things up. And I just want to bring it back to that kind of model you raised earlier on behalf of animals, with animals and by animals. When you're looking at these things and other animal studies scholars maybe want to pick up your ideas and go with it, are these primarily, are you asking here empirical questions? Are you asking how are animals doing politics or how are humans doing politics on behalf and with animals and how are animals doing politics by themselves? Or is this kind of future imagination work where you're trying to think about how the future of human animal and animal animal relations could be with on behalf by and with animals or or is it both just a a kind of final thought well so the the, our, our interest is definitely imagining a better future and so so we're we're trying to think well what would politics at its best look like what so what would what would good politics on behalf of animals look like? What would good politics by animals look like? What would good politics with animals look like? But we're not interested in fabricating images of a, of a future that are that are just completely unrealistic. And so we're 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 keen to think about that. Insofar as we're thinking about, for example, joint joint politics. I mean, we want we want we want to see any for each of these. We really want to find some real world examples that are prefigurations of what what this future ideal would be. And so, we're, we're our ultimate ambitions are, are are very ambitious, and we would like to live in a very different world in terms of of how we do politics behalf and by and, and uh, with animals, but we want our story about that future to be tied to some some real world examples of how this might work. Awesome. Thank you so much, Will. This has really been a fascinating conversation about, yeah, just the many ways in which we can think about politics, explore politics, the number of questions that are, have yet to be thought about deeply, but explored and answered. So you've given me, and and I'm sure listeners, a lot to think about in this episode. Before we say goodbye, do you want to tell us what you're working on now? And if people want to get in touch with you about about your research, how can they do that? Yeah, well, Sue and I are well embarked on a a book that'll be about exactly this, uh, doing politics with animals. And I've stopped making (laughs) predictions about exactly when it's going to be finished and published, but it is, it's in the works and, and we hope to have it done relatively soon. And yes, please, anyone who's interested, feel free to get in touch with me. So my email is just kimlicka at queensu.ca and I'd be happy to hear from people. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the show. It's been, it's been great having you on. Yeah, I enjoyed the chat. Thanks. Okay. Hi, Virginia. Welcome to the Animal Highlights. Hi, thanks for having me. It's great to have you, and I'm going to have you with me for, for the next couple of months because you're, you're a new fellow with the Animal Turn. Congratulations. I'm very happy to have you. Uh, but you're going to be helping us this season focused on animals and politics with the animal highlights, which is very exciting. Um, I love the animal highlights. So I'm delighted to have you. Before we dive into the animal highlights, though, maybe you could tell me a little bit about, uh, about yourself and the kind of work you do. Yeah, yeah. When I said thank you for having me, I realised that probably wasn't quite the right expression since I'm I'm here for a few months. Thank you. I work at the University of Exeter in England and I work on 
environmental sociology or environmental social science, sorry. So I'm really interested in people's relationship with their environment and people's relationship with animals and particularly wild animals. So at the moment, I'm looking at species reintroductions in Britain and, and how that affects people and how people affect it. People get pretty passionate about which species are allowed to run around and which aren't. Is it, it's wild boars, right, at the moment, where there's a lot of kind of contention? Yeah, um, definitely in Britain, but also across Europe. It's, they're, they're such an interesting species. And so I guess their similarity to us is what brings them into conflict with us. Like, you know, the way that the things that other people do that irritate you the most are the things that you do yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's how we maybe feel about boar. They're so resourceful and so assertive and just so adept at living in human societies. <laughs> we find that quite challenging. Well, is it, it's badges as well in the UK that you guys have been having a lot of talk about. Oh, well, that's a subject close to my own heart. The interesting thing about badgers in in the UK is that they're implicated in the transmission of bovine tuberculosis, which is a big well, it's a zoonotic disease and it's a big problem from a One Health perspective. But the the jury is still out on whether the kind of things that we're doing to to control badgers are actually helping control mm. bovine tuberculosis or whether there are other things that could be done. Um, but we're not going to be speaking about any of those animals in today's animal highlight, right? Uh, who, who are we focusing on today? Yeah, in, in this animal highlight, I want to focus on the domestic dog and particularly domestic dogs as, as, hit, as citizens of human animal societies. Yeah, they are a really interesting species to think about, partly because they were domesticated around 15,000 years ago and became the first species that we actively inclu included in our emerging societies. And over millennia, dogs and humans have developed incredible and complex relationships. Dogs have been workers, kept as pets and eaten as food. And often these relations involved exploitation. But following on from what Will Kimlicker has been talking about in this episode, what happens if we reconsider dogs in terms of how we include them in society? So in his book, Zoopolis, written with Sue Donaldson, Will Kimlicker discusses how domestic animals must be seen as full members of a human animal community with the rights associated with that membership. He writes, and I quote, Having brought domesticated animals into our society and deprived them of other possible forms of existence, we have a duty to include them in our social and political arrangements on fair terms. As such, they have rights of membership, rights that go beyond the universal rights owed to all animals and which are hence relational and differentiated. End quote. So, according to Donaldson and Kimlicker, dogs and other domesticated animals are afforded relational rights as members of a multi-species society, which extend beyond the universal rights which other non-domesticated animals have. And Donaldson and Kimlicker go on to say that citizenship is the appropriate conceptual framework for thinking about these relational membership rights. They, they highlight that domestic animals' rights to citizenship were not automatically granted when they joined human society, but are suggesting that they should be now. And the very definition of domestication is that animals are adapted to and compatible with human society, or more accurately, multi-species societies. So although we might include them in society on what Donaldson and Kimblick call fair terms, as well as giving them rights, we expect responsibilities from them. And there are schemes in countries like the US, the UK and New Zealand, which have what they call canine good citizen schemes, which are interesting in that they place stringent responsibilities on dogs, but don't afford them the rights of full citizenship that Donaldson and Kimlicker suggest. The responsibilities might be more those of wards than citizens, where good behaviour is expected, 
but the agency of the subject isn't fully recognised. Therefore, the responsibilities demanded of them don't allow them to fulfil their role in society to their full potential. And while even some animal rights theorists might be reluctant to extend the concept of citizenship to domesticated animals because it requires capacities and capabilities which many animals don't have, in the case of dogs, their intelligence, their adaptability and their social natures and structures make them eminently capable of functioning as full citizens of a human dog society and of performing their duties as citizens. Donaldson and Kimlicker stress that we should recognise domestic animals' competency in exerting their agency to cooperate and participate in human animal communities. And it was this ability which made them capable of domestication in the first place, in some cases even of self-domestication. So let's look at the kind of responsibilities which canine good citizen schemes are demanding of dogs. And I'm going to use the American Kennel Club canine good citizen test as the example. The responsibilities expected of dogs are the ability to allow a friendly stranger to approach their human companion, the ability to allow a friendly stranger to approach and pet them, the ability to allow someone to groom them, the ability to walk on a lead in a controlled manner, including in crowds of people, the ability to respond to basic instructions, and the ability to deal with common situations such as meeting another dog, distractions or disturbances, or being left with a stranger for a short period. And comparing these responsibilities with the kind of responsibilities envisaged in Zoopolis highlight how far we are from recognising dogs as full citizens of a multi-species society in the way that Donaldson and Kimlicker imagined. The kinds of responsibilities outlined in canine good citizens and schemes focus on a dog's conduct rather than enabling or allowing them to contribute to society in a way that fosters their own mental and physical well-being and human respect for them. They're not the kind of roles that Donaldson and Kimlicker might have imagined, but we might think of feats of strength and endurance like that of Togo and Bolto, who were lead sled dogs in the race to transport diphtheria antitoxin across Alaska after an outbreak in 1925. Or we might think of the acute senses of detection dogs, whose senses of smell is thought to be 40 times more acute than that of humans, and are therefore invaluable in detecting all manner of things from disease to drugs. And in a multi-species society, there might be more scope for dogs to perform such roles, allowing them to flourish and to contribute to society and enhancing human respect for them. And Donaldson and Kimlicker argue that dogs display an excellent capacity for negotiating the social rules of human dog society, and that one of the most striking differences between dogs and wild canids is that dogs are highly attuned to humans and look to them for social clues and guidance. Tamed wolves and coyotes don't do this. In other words, dogs' repertoire of skills for social cooperation has evolved in a dog-human community. Dogs are remarkably adept at reading human behaviour and negotiating terms of cooperation. If we allowed dogs more agency in our shared society, we might be better able to recognise them as full citizens and enable them to contribute in a way that avoids exploitation and encourages mutual flourishing. That's quite beautiful. I, I was thinking when you were talking about the Good good Canine Citizen Project, um, yeah, that those did sound a lot like kind of polite expectations more than responsibilities, right? Like for me, a responsibility is something that entails you, you know, like I do think guardianship or protecting your person is probably a bigger responsibility than being polite to a stranger or, or having to deal with a stranger petting you. Um, but it's interesting because that to me is part of politeness, not responsibility. Do you know what I mean? Like you've got a lot of assholes in society, human assholes who have a responsibility to pay their taxes, but they, they don't have to be nice to me. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost more like a cycling proficiency test or a driving test. It's mm. proving that you can, or demonstrating that you can function in society. Yeah. But not necessarily participate. 
Exactly. And I think I think those types of markers are really, you know, important and good that that dogs are and, and I think, you know, it's interesting that these types of tests don't exist for cats, for example, but that you've got these kinds of markers for how to move through society and that you will abide by kind of social norms, uh, right? But I, I hear what you're saying, that there is perhaps scope to giving dogs more responsibility. Uh, but what's always tricky is kind of what that line between responsibility and exploitation is. So I think it's ph phenomenal that dogs can do this type of work uh, and, and labor law is fascinating. But at what point does expecting dogs to work become exploitative, right? Yeah, and that's why, you know, even those examples I gave of sled dogs and detection dogs, even though, you know, they're, they're really allowing dogs to use, use their abilities that we don't have, mm. there is that that danger, that slippery slope that um, Donaldson and Kimlick talk about is that you, the line between, yeah, between allowing participation and slipping into exploitation is, is very thin. Yeah, uh, for sure. Thank you so much for an awesome start to our animal highlights for the season. Uh, I look forward to hearing from you more next time. Great. Talk to you soon. Thank you to Will Kimlicker for being an amazing guest, to Animals and Philosophy, Politics, Law and Ethics, Apple for sponsoring this episode, to Jeremy John for the logo and Gordon Clark for the bed music. This episode was edited by Christian Mentz, produced by myself, and the annual highlight was done by Virginia Thomas. Thank you to all involved. This is The Animal Turn with me, Claudia Hertzenfelder. For more great iRaw podcasts, visit iRawPod.com. That's I-R-O-A-R-P-O-D.com. Ah!